Fantastic. Um, so, yeah. so first of all, we'll start with uh, what is mould. Uh, so mould is one of the structures certain fungi can form. Uh, mould growth uh, in buildings generally occur, occurs as fungi inhabits building materials such as wood. Uh, many building products commonly incorporate paper wood products or solid wood members um, such as paper covered dry wall, wood cabinets and insulation. Um, most spores are kind of drawn to specific environments, making it easier for them to grow. Uh, these spores will usually only turn into a full-blown outbreak um, if certain conditions are met. Uh, various practices can be followed to mitigate mould in properties, um, but we'll come on to that just a wee bit later um, with our hints and uh, tips. Um, okay. Um, so what is damp? Uh, damp refers to the presence of excess excess moisture in a room. Um, there are uh, three different types of damp. Um, they are penetrating damp, rising damp and condensation damp. Uh, penetrating damp is caused by water leaking through walls. It tends to happen with structural issues like guttering, the roofing or cracks in the external walls. Um, rising damp um, it is the rarest form of damp and what happens with that is excess moisture at ground level travels up through the walls um, and of course we have condensation damp which is the kind of most uh, common uh, type of damp and that's just caused by um, moist air comes into contact with a colder surface like a wall, a mirror or a window. Um, that is the most common, it's also the easiest one to kind of uh, eliminate um, and we'll come on to how you can eliminate these uh, that issue later on as well. So I want to move forward. Mm. There we go. Um, so what is condensation? Uh, condensation is caused when warm damp air is released into the atmosphere of the home um, and is unable to disperse outside. Uh, this normally happens uh, because of lack of ventilation in the property um, that allows the water laden air to come into contact with the cold surface and just lay there. Uh, over time, of course, that condensation will grow into mould um, and can lead to a, a plethora of health issues um, and implications. Um, and yeah, so that is the three main types of um, um, mould damping condensation. Okay. Okay, so um, now we'll hear from um, our lead adjud adjudicator, um, Sarah Hess. So let me just unmute you and you can tell us a wee bit about yourself um, and then we'll go to asking the questions. Is that gonna, has that worked? <laughs> No. We would have technical difficulties, wouldn't we? <laughs> Are you able to unmute yourself, Sarah? There we go. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank better. you. <laughs> um, so if you just tell us a wee bit um, about yourself um, and then we'll run through the questions. So I'll ask you the questions and you can give us your answers. Um, okay, so um, I'm a lead adjudicator with um, um, Safe Deposit Scotland. Um, over a period of about 10 years, I've been dealing with um, the issues that, that arise in adjudication. Um, these, uh, these are probably very familiar to all our audience today, cleaning, damage, gardening, redecoration, um, and clearly damp and mould and condensation um, cut across many of these issues because we see uh, claims for cleaning with regard to, to mould, um, sometimes damage, sometimes redecoration. Um, and I also um, work for SDS Resolve, which is the mediation branch of Safe Deposit Scotland. And from time to time, we, we see that, that these issues of mould damp and condensation arise very frequently in some of the issues brought to us by both landlords and tenants, um, because it's uh, it's a, a common problem, um, particularly during the winter in Scotland during tenancies. Perfect. Okay, so we'll get started with the questions then. So the first question we have is, if I can get it on the screen, what evidence does the adjudicator need to come to a fair decision? 
Gosh, that's a really broad question, Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. And um, what evidence do, would the adjudicator like to see to come to a, a, a fair decision in general? Um, and I'd start off by saying, first of all, that um, the landlord makes a claim. And so it's always for the landlord to provide sufficient evidence to make their claim, isn't it? Um, in legal terms, we would say that the burden of proof lies with the landlord. It's for the landlord actually to prove that the tenant has breached their obligations under the tenancy agreement, and that's caused some sort of damage to the property. So when the, when the landlord's putting their claim together, um, we need, first of all, to see a tenancy agreement. That's absolutely fundamental, isn't it? Because um, we need to be able to understand the obligations of the tenant um, in the tenancy, and we need to understand exactly what the landlord's requiring them to do. So that's the very first thing. Um, we need to see information about the, the condition of the property at the start of the tenancy. Um, and there are various, various pieces of evidence that a, that a landlord can provide in that regard. But, but best of all is a check-in report um, or an inventory schedule of, or, and, of condition prepared at the time that the, the tenancy has started. Um, and that should be taken reasonably closely to the, the start date of the tenancy agreement. You know, we understand that it might not be taken actually on the day the tenancy starts, but we certainly would like to see it, you know, just within a two or three days either side of, of the start date of that tenancy, so that we can be sure that it reflects the condition of the property when the tenant moved in. And we also need to understand what's happened during the tenancy. So we have to see that having, having seen what the property was like at the start of the tenancy, that we, we know what it was like when the tenant moved out, so that we can see that there's been some sort of change during the tenancy. Now, again, the best kind of evidence that a landlord can submit to, to establish what the property was like when the tenant left is a checkout report. Um, and, um, you know, we like to see independent evidence. So the best checkout reports, we would say, uh, are compiled by independent inventory clerks. Although there's nothing to stop a, a landlord um, going in, putting their own checkout report together, um, particularly if they're going to provide us with, with photographs. But if we do see photographs, either from the start or the end of the tenancy, then they need to be clearly dated. Um, we need to understand as adjudicators what they show, because obviously the impression that we get of the property is from what the landlord gives to us. We're not actually coming out and carrying out an inspection of the property. So we need to understand everything that happens in the pro property from the landlord's submission. So those are, those are kind of the three main pieces of evidence. But then I guess you want me to talk about mould and damp and, and <laughs> condensation specifically, don't you? Um, and the, the evidence is uh, it, it's particularly important if the landlord wants to ground a claim um, for damage or redecoration because of these issues um, that, that we have very specific evidence. So what I would say at the outset is that these issues, um, David, as you've already said at the start, you know, there are a variety of factors which can affect um, the development of mould, damp and condensation. Um, and one of the problems that landlords have in establishing a claim um, under, on this basis is that they need to make clear what the cause of the mould, damp and condensation is. And they need to, if they're going to, to make a successful claim, they need to show that the likely cause um, of the damage is was the result of uh, something that the tenants done or not done. Now, that can be very difficult because um, you, you mentioned that there are various kind of forms of damp. There's penetrating damp, there's rising damp, as well as mould and condensation, which is a little bit different because it arises from within the home. And you can get mould developing, making itself apparent um, in situations where there's mould and rising damp too. So there can be lots of different things going on within a property. Um, and for that reason, we would always recommend that a landlord gets specialist assistance, um, usually in, um, in the form of a specialist report. Um, now, there are, 
there are lots of people out there who can give you a specialist report on mould and damp. Um, I would say that it's a good idea to make sure that the person that you're, you're roping in to give you advice on this is independent. Um, there are very many damp specialists in Scotland. And I would just kind of say, just be careful if you're, if you're uh, getting a damp specialist in, because very often, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll um, provide you with information. They'll pr provide you with information perhaps about, you know, what's, what's caused your, your mould. But then they'll, they'll obviously be trying to, to, um, to sell perhaps products or a particular set of work for you. So um, if you don't get a, a jump specialist in, then there are other people out there. You know, the, there are some, uh, firms of surveyors who can give you advice as to, to what's caused this problem. But as an adjudicator, what I need to see from a specialist report is that the cause of the problem within the property was the tenant, um, that it was something either that the tenant has or hasn't done in breach of their obligations under the tenancy that has caused a problem. Does that answer your question? That's, it, it that's quite, it's quite it, a long answer. No, that, that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, but do you think uh, mid-tenancy inspection reports uh, go a long way in being helpful to kind of prove a clear deterioration of condition? They can do, they okay. can. They can, you know, mid-tenancy um, reports can show how quickly a problem is developed. Um, you know, if you've got if you've got information at the start of the tenancy and you've got a report three months later mm -hmm. um, and you've got the development of mould in that time, then then that can be useful information to an adjudicator. Yeah, but you still, need to, you still need to prove that the liability likely is with the with the tenant. You still need to prove what caused it. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. You have to you have to prove that it's more likely than not that the tenant was the likely cause of the damage. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, so our next question. What if the tenant has admitted to not opening windows when showering? Okay, so um, it depends very much where the, where the problem lies within the property. Uh, and this might be an obvious thing to say, but if you've got, yeah, and the adjudicator will have a, will have a handle on the likely layout of the property. You know, they'll have a handle on whether we're looking at a flat, or a house, um, you know, where the bathroom is in the property. Um, if there's mould in the bathroom and the tenant has admitted to not opening windows when showering um, and there's mould on the bathroom ceiling, say, or above the window, then, you know, that, that may have an impact. However, what I would also say is there might be trickle vents in the windows. It might be that the tenant's using trickle vents rather than opening the windows. Just because they're not opening the windows, doesn't mean that they're not ventilating the property um, because ventilation can take various forms. Um, it can be uh, via windows, via trickle vents, or even via an extractor fan. So just because the tenant doesn't open the windows doesn't mean that they're automatically um, causing the development of mould. If there's mould elsewhere in the property, if it's not in the bathroom, if it's in the kitchen or the dining room or the living room, then it's possible that it doesn't matter whether they, or not they open the windows when they're showing, there might be other things going on. Okay, perfect. Um, so the extractor fan in the bathroom is broken and the tenant has reported this issue, but it does not get fixed. Who's liable if mould forms in this instance? Well, again, it's difficult to be cut and dried um, in an answer like this because it depends <laughs> on what all the evidence says, as you, as you all understand. Um, but in a situation where the extractor fan is, bro is broken in the bathroom, then it is usually the landlord's responsibility to get that fixed. And if they don't get it fixed, and it's maybe you know a, a dark bathroom in a Glasgow tenement, there's no other form of ventilation and mould forms, then obviously the tenant can point to the fact that they've reported that to the landlord and that they've not taken any action. You know, the, the landlord is under a responsibility um, to make sure that any extraction systems, et cetera, within the property um, for the purposes of ventilation are properly operational. And if that's not the case, then they will have to take some responsibility for any damage that arises. Okay, perfect. Um, the silicon seal around the bath is black with mould. Can I claim for this? 
Um, yes, you can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like a different situation to kind of the formation of, of, of mould kind of on the ceiling or on the walls of the property. Um, the ceiling around the bath, if it's black with mould, then normally we would expect the, that the tenant could wipe this mould away just as it starts to fall, you know, if they have a regular, if they have a regular cleaning habit. Um, if they regularly wipe down the sealant, then it's unlikely that mould will form. Um, and if it does form, then um, the, the landlord can claim for it to be cleaned as part of a cleaning claim, or they can perhaps claim for the mould to be replaced. Um, obviously, the, the adjudicator will be looking at the condition of the sealant at the start and at the end of the tenancy, and they may well take into account fair wear and tear over the course of the tenancy in, in reaching a conclusion as to the, the cost um, and the condition of the of the sealant when the when the tenant moved in. So you may not necessarily get a get an, an award for the full replacement cost of um, sealant around a bath, but but yes you can certainly claim. Um, mold has caused the need for full redecoration to take place. Can I claim for this? You can certainly claim for, for, redec for redecoration in association with mould. Um, uh, I go back to what I said before, really, you know, we, we need to see that the, that the tenant has responsibility um, and liability for, um, for any damage that's been caused. So it's useful to see, you know, what the, what the condition of the property was at check-in, at check-out, um, perhaps information about the cause of the damage, um, you know, information that specifically says that the tenant was the likely cause of the damage. Um, otherwise, it's it's more difficult to, to ground a claim for, for redecoration because I go back to the fact that we're needing to see that the tenant has breached their obligations in some way under the tenancy agreement before we can make an award. Okay. Thank you. Um, what are the tenant's obligations when properly ventilating a property? Well, that will depend very much on the tenancy agreement and what the tenancy agreement says. So, um, you know, the, if the, we see um, a number of clauses very commonly in, in the Scottish model tenancy agreement in particular. You know, we may see that um, the tenant is obliged to take reasonable care of the property. Um, reasonable being the, um, the key word there. Um, they may be specifically responsible for heating and ventilating the property. Um, and again, you know, there, there has to be um, reasonableness in that. For example, I sometimes see tenants in ground floor flats who say, well, you know, I open the windows after I've had a shower, but by the same token, um, I'm in a ground floor flat. It's not secure for me to leave the windows open when I go out. And that seems to me to be quite reasonable. Um, you know, and the landlord in that sort of situation might consider um, you know, perhaps making other facilities available um, to the tenant for ventilation. I mentioned trickle vents in windows if you've got relatively new windows um, and also extractive plans to help ventilate the property. Um, so the tenant does have an obligation to properly um, ventilate the property, but that is limited by reasonableness. Um, it doesn't mean that they need to have all the windows in the property open all the time. You know, that would that would be unreasonable. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And what are the landlord's obligations when mould appears? Um, it, it's almost difficult to provide an answer to that because it, 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 the, the answer really is it depends. Um, in Scotland, um, the repairing standard um, is, uh, was introduced by the Housing Act 2006, um, and that requires the landlord to make sure that the property is uh, wind tight and water tight. And with the development of mould, the landlord is specifically required to make sure that the property is water tight. Now, I mentioned earlier on that mould and damp and condensation can all occur in a property. Um, and the landlord really needs to make sure that, um, that the property has no penetrating damp, has no rising damp that might, you know, result in, in the development of mould. Um, if there are none of those things, 
and the and it's just a simple situation perhaps where the tenant hasn't heated or ventilated the property then um if the if the landlord can show that that's that's what's caused the mold that the the tenants lack of heating and ventilation then clearly the the um the liability switches then onto the tenant away from the landlord but the landlord has to have in the background their their basic responsibility for keeping the property in a good structural condition in accordance with the repairing standard. Okay. Thank you. And finally, do the tenants have any obligations after reporting mould? Um, I, I mean, very often the tenancy agreement requires the tenant to report any issues that arise. And that, in, that includes mould um, in a in the property. Um, do they have any obligations after reporting mould? I think, I think it depends very much. That they obviously have a continued obligation in terms of the tenancy agreement to heat and ventilate and take reasonable care. And regardless of the fact that they've, you know, whether or not they've reported mould, they have those continuing obligations under the tenancy agreement. Um, but I think it's it's going to depend very much what any investigations into the mould issues may may throw up, um, and um, their obligations. Obviously, if they have, you know if if investigations show that they failed to do something uh, and that's resulted in the mould, then they have a they have a continuing obligation to actually start doing those things to either um, prevent the development of mould or. or um, stop the situation becoming worse. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Sarah, um, I think we have some questions here in the chat um, that if you're okay with, Sarah, uh, we'll ask you. Is that all right? I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't promise, but I'll do my best. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, we have Wendy um, who says, if an agent gets a damp specialist in at the end of the tenancy to prove it is condensation due to the tenant's lifestyle, uh, can we charge the tenant the cost of the damp specialist? Um, if you're making a claim against a deposit, if, if you're talking about charging a tenant sort of under a deposit claim, um, then yes, you can. Um, you, you can um, claim for the damp specialist report as part of the uh, as part of any um, claim against the deposit um, for damp. What I, what I would say is that it has to be very clear in the damp specialist report that the tenant is responsible for, um, you know, for the development of an issue. You know, we're not, we, we need to see that very clearly. Um, you know, it needs to be absolutely clear that this is, a, this is a lifestyle issue and this results from the way that the tenant has lived in the property. Okay. Perfect. Um, Shaz uh, asks, if the tenant dries up their clothes in the bedroom, who's liable for the mould? Again, I would say it depends. You know, there might be um, a problem with, um, you know, there's a, the, the gutters above the bedroom, which may make the which may make the bedroom more than usually damp, and which may um, and which may increase the likelihood of the development of mould. Mm -hmm. um, just because a tenant dries clothes in the bedroom doesn't necessarily mean that damp will form. Um, it may be that the tenant dries clothes in the bedroom but opens the windows when they do so, um, in which case, you know, mould won't necessarily form because the tenant's drying bedrooms, uh, dry, drying bedrooms, drying clothes in the bedroom. So again, it goes to, it goes to the likely cause and um, it doesn't necessarily follow just because somebody um, dries clothes in a room that um, mould will fall. You know, there, there, have, there may be other things at work. Okay. Perfect. Um, Kina, um, this is a question from them. Is it possible that mould or damp particularly uh, might be present, for example, due to leaks in ceilings and windows? That is not apparent to the eye, but for which a tenant may still be held reason, uh, responsible or be charged for. Um, so, um, normally, I would say that if there is damp in a property, then um, 
there are normally signs of it. Yeah. If there's damp coming from a roof, then you normally see damp staining on the ceiling. Um, you might see cracking. You might see, um, you know, um, sort of um, pools starting to form in plaster work, et cetera, et cetera. There normally is some sort of sign that there's damp in a property. Um, it would be very unusual for there to be damp or mould and for it not to manifest itself in the property um, during a tenancy if the tenant has caused it. Um, so, um, you know, again, if you've got a suspicion that there's damp and you're not seeing any signs, if perhaps there's a little bit of an odd smell or something like that, then it might be something that you would like um, someone actually to go into the property to inspect and get a sense of, of actually what's going on. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have a question from Sarah uh, who says, I have had an incident recently where I lost the adjudication process due to black mould in the bath ceiling. This was marked as clean and good at the start of the tenancy, and I was told this would be betterment if a claim was made against us for any kind of replacement. Um, I will say we're not really here to talk about individual cases. If you do have a question about a particular case, um, please do. Uh, contact us directly. We will uh, provide you with our contact details if you don't have them at the end of the slides. Um, just we don't want to be talking about people's live or just finished cases um, with other people about. Um, so if you contact me um, directly, Sarah, um, I'll answer your question for you. Okay. Um, so Wendy says, and for her question, uh, what happens when a tenant advises they always open the bathroom window when showering and have the heating on, but there's still mould around the bath and on the walls? Say the property was freshly painted for a tenant moving in and within one and a half years, there was mould in the bathroom. How do we prove the tenant was, has not heated and ventilated? We can prove uh, that the mould is present. Yeah, I think that goes back to, to what I've already said before. Um, I have to say, if I, and you might disagree with this, but but um, over a period of time, I have seen a number of properties where um, where a bathroom is freshly painted for the for the tenant to go in, and it can actually be a sign that there's going a, an ongoing issue with mould. If at the start of every tenancy the bathroom is freshly painted at the start of the tenancy, it may be a, a suggestion that you know there is perhaps an ongoing problem with mould that that might be something to do with the property rather than something that the tenant's done. Um, if um, if you think that the tenant is responsible, then for us to actually make an award, we need to see that third party specialist report or opinion that says that the tenant is responsible because there can be so many other things going on in properties that can result in the formation of damp and mould, as I've said earlier, that, you know, it just because there's mould in the property during the tenancy, it doesn't necessarily follow that the tenant's at fault. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, from Ross Winton, we have, is the uh, prevention of window condensation and moisture the responsibility of the tenant or the landlord? And I think we're talking about during the tenancy. Window condensation. Yes, and cleaning that up, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, it tends to be a very ephemeral thing, window condensation. It's just a very short-lived thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, in these cold mornings then. Um, when I get up in the morning, um, I sometimes will find condensation on my windows um, just because it's been very cold outside and, you know, it's been it's been perhaps warmer in the house. So, yeah, you know, you would expect a tenant to to wipe this up and, and wipe it away. Um, it's not something that we would expect to see long standing um, and um, uh, and um, uh, sort of between the start and the end of the tenancy, we'd expect it, it almost to be forming on a daily basis, perhaps. And um, I think Ross maybe just said there, is it reasonable to ask the tenants to wipe it away? Um, and, and yes, is that not part of a, of a cleaning obligation, I would have thought? Yeah, um, we have the same view. Um, I don't think it'd be reasonable to expect the landlord to go around the house every day to clean up the condensation in the window. No, no. Uh, yeah, tenant <laughs> responsibility on that one. Um, uh, CMA Davis says, in the winter, what is perceived as a tenant's responsibility to heat a property? 
Uh, for insurance purposes, we are now required to maintain 50, 15 Celsius at all times in an empty property if we leave the heating on. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I don't think that I don't think that there is um, a specific obligation. I, it, it goes back to reasonableness. And it's quite interesting because there have been a number of studies over a period of time, for example, about this idea of, of how much heating is reasonable, how mm -hmm. much heating is required in a property to prevent the formation of mould and condensation. Um, and there was, you know, a few years ago, it used to be said, well, the heating needs to be on all day, just at a low level. But now um, I read a study just a couple of months ago, which said that that, that was wrong. Um, you know, that a couple of hours in the morning and a couple of hours in the evening was enough. Um, personally, I think it depends very much on the structure of the property um, and on the individual idiosyncrasies of the property. Um, I don't think necessarily that you can say how much heating is required, um, you know, to, to keep away some of these issues. Um, it, it's sometimes on a, on a, almost on a suck it and see basis, just to see um, what happens. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so we've got another one that says, is it reasonable to expect a tenant to use a dehumidifier to prevent condensation damp? This no. is felt like, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, no. <laughs> so it's extremely expensive to run a dehumidifier um, and I would say that um, kind of um, I would say that it's unreasonable for a landlord to expect a tenant to run a dehumidifier on a regular basis um, even if there's been a leak at the property and you've got damp then I would ex I would expect a landlord to at least contribute to the costs if a dehumidifier was necessary okay um, so we've got Claire that's asking, what would be the best evidence to pass that would show that a property wasn't kept at a good temperature during the tenancy? Comments on regular inspections enough to say that the property was cold? Um, no, I don't think so, because, um, you know, even a, a three monthly inspection, um, if you're going in every three months and the property is cold, then, I mean, you can you can say, well, the property is cold, but that doesn't mean that the tenant hasn't been heating it. Um, uh, I think that um, I, I think that, again, it would be something for a specialist to be able to point out that that um, mould and damp has formed because a property perhaps wasn't heated properly. Um, and I have seen situations where where you know this this has been leveled at tenants that perhaps they haven't heated and they've actually sent in their, their bills you know the gas bills and the electricity bills just to show the level of energy consumption that has gone on at a property over over um over the course of a tenancy and that they have actually heated the property to a reasonable level okay um we've got colin that is asking are we seeing or should we expect a rise in mold um, or condensation due to the cost of living crisis and tenants not opening windows and ventilating property and trying to retain heat within the property. We should find it necessary to educate tenants into living in a property and self-manage the built environment, open windows, heat property, not force dry clothes on a radiator, make sure extractor fans are working efficiently. Yeah, I think it's a question quite a lot of people have been asking quite recently, uh, which yeah. brought this, um, this um, webinar on. Uh, as a priority. Um, have, have you have you um, seen we, we an actually, increase we, in the number of claims? We that? actually haven't, not yet. And I think because the cost of living crisis is in, in, in broad terms very qu quite recent, um, people now are only just turning off their heat and not putting the heating on um, and not ventilating the, pro the property uh, properly. Um, so I, I fully expect us to see much more cases when it comes to mould, damp and condensation issues and the properties um, because as we know mould um, grows over time um, and we need that time to kind of see the effects. Uh, so I don't see much right now but I, I fully expect it to be a, a big claim in the future. Yeah, certainly I was, uh, I was um, speaking with the Scottish Association of Landlords a couple of weeks ago and they say that their advice lines are seeing a massive increase um, in the number of landlords um, inquiring about, um, you know, issues with mould condensation and tenants reporting 
And I think there are two things at work here. I think that there is um, a couple of, uh, there have been, there've been a, a lot of media reports, first of all, about uh, damp condensation and mould in properties. Um, there have been um, a couple of um, very sad incidences of specific cases down south um, where um, the coroner in particular has highlighted the, the presence of mould in a property can have an impact on tenants' health. Um, that was not in a private rental property, that was in a, in um, social housing. Um, but, you know, this has, this has flagged up the issue, I think, with tenants. Um, and I think also that um, the energy crisis has, has flagged it up with landlords who are obviously very concerned. Um, and what Sal was saying is that um, they have found that um, there's been an uptake in the use of their fact sheet. Um, and they issue a fact sheet um, for their members, which actually kind of gives hints and tips um, to landlords about um, how to manage damp and mould in properties. Um, and I think that I'm seeing those kind of fact sheets come through as evidence in our cases, um, you know, where they've been provided to tenants at the start of tenancies, you know, saying, um, you need to do this, you need to open your windows, you need to make sure you're heating um, this, this um, property properly. Um, mm -hmm. But then there are also responsibilities on, on landlords with regard to, to um, energy performance certificates um, and also making sure that properties are, are properly insulated. So there are many things at work and, and yes, I think it's inevitable that, that we will see um, an, an uptick in the number of claims. Um, which is why it's important for you to know what we're looking for in terms of evidence. Exactly, 100%. Um, we're just going to finish off Karen's uh, question. Um, she's um, off the back of the dehumidifier. Um, so she states, I fully understand tenants drying clothes in their homes or cutting back on heating, but if offered a dehumidifier, can I expect them to use it and, what ev and evidence it if they refuse? I think it depends very much on the circumstances. I think if you've got, um, you know, you've had uh, leaks from pipes or something like that, and you've got damp in a property, then um, it's more reasonable to expect a tenant to um, to use a dehumidifier. I don't think you can expect a tenant to use a dehumidifier as a matter of course. I think you need a specific set of circumstances. Um, and I, I go back to the idea that if you've got a tenant who's not heating the property, they're not going to pay to run a dehumidifier because they are very expensive to run. Okay. Um, so as a landlord, you know, you've got to expect um, a level of reasonableness. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's it for our question section here. So we'll just move on. Um, next up, Samantha will be giving you some uh, hints and tips and tricks uh, with the problems and the solutions. Um, I want to take this time to thank you, Sarah, um, for answering all of our questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I know you're on hand if we have any more. Um, <laughs> all righty, but thank you, Sarah. Okay, so I've just kind of got um, a few examples um, kind of in the next couple of slides. Um, so for example, the bathroom, um, the problem, um, mold grows where water collects. Um, so the solution for that would kind of be after showering, just wiping down the walls in the bathroom, um, and this could kind of prevent anything else um, going on there. Um, in the living room, um, the problem is condensation can build up um, behind furniture pushed against external walls. Um, so the solution would just to be to keep the furniture four to six, four to six inches away from the walls. Um, I will be moving my furniture when I get home. <laughs> I think I'll be doing the same. <laughs> Um, hallway with the radiator, um, the problem is, or a very common problem, not even just in a hallway, um, but in kind of all rooms that have radiators, is a lot of people dry clothes um, on radiators and that will spread water vapour. Um, a potential solution is to hang clothes in the bathroom um, and put an extractor fan on um, if the bathroom has one um, for that. Then we have the kitchen, so um, mould can grow um, on various things so it can grow on like wallpaper um, and plasterboard and um, a solution is just to minimize moisture so lids on um, steamy pans and use extractor fans um, 
within the kitchen if they're available as well. Um, and then finally, our windows. Um, as we've discussed, um, condensation collects on cold window panes um, and windows should be open at least once a day, whether that be the window or the wee little trickle vents, um, but try and get some sort of air um, into the window or into the house. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think we have one more question here. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever happened to a good old drying pulley? You know, I know, I have one in my house actually. Um, I know. <laughs> They go for quite a lot nowadays, actually. I think everyone's trying to buy them. Um, so we move on to the, the last slide, actually, and this is where we'll end our webinar. Um, of course, uh, you know who we are and how to contact us, but our phone number and our email addresses are there. Um, the info one is for more general inquiries um, and day-to-day -day deposit uh, functions, um, and the ADR uh, inbox is, will come straight through to us. And we'll be more than happy to answer any questions, any more questions that you have um, on mould, damp and condensation. I will caveat that with uh, the fact that we are not experts in the field. Um, you were um, speaking to an expert there, Sarah. Um, so we will definitely try our best to answer your questions if you do have them. If we don't, we'll be phoning Sarah every two seconds <laughs> um, with the questions that you have. Um, I want to thank you all for coming along today. Um, and some people, people asked if you can have a recording of this. Uh, we are planning on uh, sending out the recording. Um, we might be publishing it to our YouTube channel, uh, but most probably we will be transcribing it and putting it into our uh, newsletter. So please do keep a wee eye out for that um, as uh, we would like to publish a full report on it, um, given uh, how popular it is and how well attended it is. Okay. Um, but once again, thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you for answering our questions um, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye. See you later.